Coming up on New Day at Adirang, South Korea on course to confirm more than 1,700 new COVID-19 infections over the past 24 hours. Reservations for 16 and 17-year-olds to get the Pfizer shot start today, but it's up to the teenagers and their parents to decide if they get it. Japan's parliament elects former diplomat Fumio Kishida as the country's new prime minister. His cabinet features allies of Shinzo Abe, Japan's longest serving PM. Plus, the Nobel Prize in Medicine 2021 is awarded jointly to two American scientists for their discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. Hello and thanks for joining us for our first ever edition of New Day at Arirang. It's 8 a.m. on Tuesday, October 5th here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Mark Broom. I'm Kim Morgan. Mark and I will be with you for an hour at this time every weekday to bring you all the news of the day from Korea and around the world. Today we are going to start with the COVID-19 situation in South Korea as it's the issue on many people's minds. The country's health authorities are kicking off the next phase of their national inoculation campaign by opening vaccine reservations for teenagers who are 16 to 17. Officials say online bookings for that age group will start this evening. For more on that and other COVID-19 related news, we have our Choi won Jung in the studio. won Jung. Good morning. Good morning. The KDCA has said that 77% of the nation's population have received their first jab of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, this next phase is expected to boost the figures even further, right? Good morning, guys. Uh, like you said, starting today, the Tuesday here in Korea, the teenager age between 16 and 17 will be able to book vaccine appointments with their parents' consent. Like previous uh, the reservation methods, res reserving a slot will be done online starting 8 p.m. Korea time. Beginning October 18th, those with a reserv reservation will begin getting the mRNA vaccine from Pfizer with a three-week interval between the first and the second dose. For kids between uh, 12 to 15 years old, their booking window starts on October 18th and their vaccination will kick off in November. Again, with their parents have to consent. Also, the reservation for the third additional vaccine shot, so-called the booster shots, will start on Tuesday. At uh, AP in Korea time, those over 60s and the most me uh, medical workers will be eligible to receive the extra jabs. And this comes after health authorities have been seeing numerous breakthrough cases due to the Delta variant. And while we're on the topic of booster shots, it's not only Korea that's getting involved in giving booster shots to their populations. Other parts of the world are doing it now as well. Tell us more about the latest on that. Yeah, so Europe's a top drug agency has approved the booster shots for people 18 and older. The European Medicines Agency said on Monday this will be the case for all adults and will be available for people at least six months and after second dose. They will get the Pfizer vaccine. So what's interesting is that this approval is a much larger age group than the US FDA approved. The United States only allowing for those six over 65. In the U.S., Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine is seeking FDA approval for its booster shot. The pharmaceutical company will be submitting the necessary paperwork this week. The Janssen vaccine is a single dose, and the, the FDA and outside experts have been discussing whether to give the green light for this vaccine, and we'll see what unfolds over the coming days. Now, Won Jung, um, people in South Korea are returning to work today after a three-day-long three holiday. Right. Now, um, health authorities are concerned of a possible spike that could be um, evident in, in this week. Now, what do, how do we forecast the figures for today? So, from midnight to 9 p.m. the, uh, the uh, Monday, new cases were reported uh, 1,515, but the final figure through midnight is expected to be around 1,700. The daily figure to drop uh, below 2,000 mark recently. However, this could be a, a temporary slowdown because a few tests were conducted the long weekend. Authorities are also concerned about a holiday surge. 
as more people travel around the country during the three-day weekend. Now, I'll be back with the more, more conf uh, the confirmed daily figure later in the day. Yeah, we normally get that in around two and a half hours mm -hmm. right, so from now. Right, so three hours or so. Right? Yeah, and uh, considering it was in the 3,000 range not so long ago, mm -hmm. a dip to 1,700 would be very welcome. We appreciate your uh, such uh, segment today. Wang Jong, and we'll see you tomorrow. A pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, in other news, North Korea on Monday answered a direct phone call from South Korea as the regime restored cross-border communication lines some eight weeks after they were severed. Pyongyang cut the lines in the summer after it took exception to the now-concluded joint military drills between Seoul and Washington. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim Demi reports. Inter-Korean communication lines are back on as of Monday morning, 55 days after the North became unresponsive to the South's irregular phone calls in August over the South Korea-U.S. joint military drills. The South Korean government confirmed that the two Koreas had made contact through a separate joint liaison office channel and a military hotline. Welcoming the restoration, Saar's Unification Ministry noted as such a decision by the North lays the foundations to improve inter-Korean ties. Through stable management of communication lines and a swift resumption of dialogue, the government hopes to begin and advance substantive discussions on improving inter-Korean relations and establishing peace on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's defense ministry also voiced hope that the latest step will help alleviate military tensions on the Korean Peninsula. A U.S. State Department spokesperson told the Yonam News Agency that Washington strongly supports inter-Korean cooperation, saying that the restored hotlines are important in creating a more stable environment. The restoration comes just less than a week after the regime's leader Kim Jong-un expressed a willingness to do so as part of efforts to improve inter-Korean relations during a major policy speech. The North State Media reported early on Monday morning that the lines would be back to normal operation as of 9 a.m. The regime also urged us hard to make positive efforts and work on the so-called major tasks to put inter-Korean relations back on track. Pyongyang has long insisted that Seoul and Washington must drop hostile policies against the North, as well as the so-called double standard of carrying out joint military exercises while criticizing the North's missile activities. The North has called such moves purely defensive. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Now, following on from Dami's report there, the U.S. State Department has underscored the need for North Korea to fully abide by U.N. Security Council sanctions. It's also urging the regime to comply with the resolutions that ban the North from testing or developing weapons of mass destruction. The remarks came on Monday in response to Pyongyang's criticism of the U.N. Security Council for convening an emergency meeting last week to address the regime's latest missile launches. The U.S. State Department, however, reaffirmed Washington's support for inter-Korean dialogue a day after the North restored inter-Korean direct communication lines that were cut off for nearly two months. It added that Washington will continue to cooperate closely with South Korea. So we've been talking a lot about how North Korea on Monday restored those direct communication lines with South Korea. It's coming eight weeks or so after the regime severed the hotline between the two sides. Now, this gesture coming despite the North's launching in recent weeks of not just one, but a series of rather advanced missiles. For more on the significance of the line being restored, the general state of inter-Korean relations and North Korea-U.S. ties, we're joined on Skype by Professor Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Professor of International Relations at King's College London and the author of the book North Korea-U.S. Relations from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un. Professor, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Professor, the inter-Korean communication line was down for more than 50 days. How much significance do you put on it being restored? And why do you think North Korea is reopening it at this particular point in time? Well, I think it is significant uh, because this goes back to the policy that North Korea seemed to be following before the joint military drills. 
in, in my view, North Korea had to protest uh, against the drills. Uh, it has been a long-term policy of the North Korean regime. And now that the drills are uh, in, in the past and North Korea has tested new technologies itself, new missile technologies, we're back to where we were uh, back in, in, in July, uh, sorry, in, 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 in June and early July. So I think that now uh, we will see the restoration of dialogue between the two Koreas for a period of weeks and months because North Korea wants to see what it can get out of this dialogue with South Korea. Now, as you would expect, Professor, that South Korea welcomed the North's decision to do this. But what reasonably can Seoul expect? President Moon would like some kind of end of war declaration and another inter-Korean summit before he leaves office. Do you actually foresee the reopening of this line naturally evolving to something much more meaningful? Well, I think that President Moon's policy has been very clear to lay the foundations for a stable engagement process and hopefully peace process between the two Koreas. And he's going to try uh, to do this until he leaves office. Uh, whether there is a summit or not, I think it will depend on whether President Moon can obtain significant material concessions uh, from the North Korean regime that he can present to the South Korean people as a substantial development in inter-Korean relations. Uh, a peace declaration, I think, will be very important because it is uh, quite symbolic. It would be quite symbolic if it comes to happen. So it would be the, it could be the concession that President Moon uh, is looking for and that he could present to the next uh, South Korean president who will be elected in, in March as a starting point for future inter-Korean relations. Now, Professor, let's shift to the North Korea-U.S. relations. Now, despite the regime's numerous weapons demonstration, Washington hasn't strongly criticized them. But still, it seems like the North is refusing any kind of interaction with the Biden administration. How do you see Pyongyang-Washington ties unfolding over the next three years? Well, I think what's happening with the Biden administration as opposed to the Trump administration is that U.S.-North Korea relations have to advance in parallel with inter-Korean relations. So regardless of whether North Korea wants it or not, if inter-Korean relations are to move forward, North Korea will have to sit down with the U.S. to negotiate the concerns that the Biden administration and uh, the U.S. government has about uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons, uh, long-range missiles, potentially human rights as well. So I think that North Korea will be forced uh, at some point to negotiate with the Biden administration whether it likes it or not. And once it does this, we'll have a more normal diplomatic process, starting with uh, working-level talks, as opposed to what we had during the Trump administration, which was the high-level or top-level summits between Washington and Pyongyang, but that had very little substance. I think the Biden administration will pursue a very different policy from the Trump administration, and ultimately North Korea will probably be forced to agree to it. Yeah, the Trump administration very much was a more top-down approach to North Korea diplomacy. But finally, I wanted to get your thoughts regarding North Korea's uh, various missiles it's been firing. They are more technologically advanced than the ones we've seen fired by the North in the past. Should the international community be worried about them? And perhaps more importantly, from where all of a sudden did the North find these new rocket building skills? I think the second question is very interesting, right? We, we have to assume that there has been uh, support coming from, from China, potentially from Russia as well, and of course indigenous developments. North Korea has shown uh, that it has the ability and the technological uh, capabilities necessary to continue to progress in its missile and, and, and nuclear uh, programs uh, together with the outside support that I, that I mentioned. I do think, though, that as long as North Korea only conducts short-range and maybe mid-range missile tests, we're going to see limited concern from the international community. Yes, there will be condemnation, uh, as there should be, because they go, uh, in many cases, against the UN Security Council resolutions. But clearly, the US uh, right now only cares about uh, ICBMs and nuclear tests. And even if you look at uh, South Korea and if you look at other North Korean uh, neighbors, there are denunciations uh, of these tests. Uh, but really, unless we see a major provocation, it seems that the international community, and this includes uh, South Korea, this includes the U.S., is going to be willing to talk to North Korea. And I think that Pyongyang uh, is aware of this.
Yeah, I think there's a vast difference between short-range missile launches and ICBM tests. But we thank you very much for your uh, insights. If you are joining us from London, we appreciate you staying up so late for us, and we look forward to speaking to you again in the future. That was Professor Ramon Pacheco Pardo, Professor of International Relations at King's College London, on the restoration of the hotline and the current state of play with North Korea. Fumio Kishida has been sworn in as Japan's new prime minister, succeeding Yoshihide Suga. Yes, yeah, shortly after his election, Kishida announced his new cabinet and said he's going to dissolve the Japanese parliament next week to hold a general election that's scheduled, penciled in for October 31st. Min Sukyun with the details. Fumio Kishida has become Japan's new prime minister following a parliamentary vote on Monday. He was elected leader of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party last week and has now been officially confirmed to succeed outgoing Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga. Following Monday's vote, Kishida announced his new cabinet with key posts given to close allies of former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. This includes Chief Cabinet Secretary Hirokachi Masuno and Trade Minister Kuichi Hakiuda. Of the 20 posts, only two of Suga's cabinet members retained their seats, Foreign Minister Toshimitsu Mutegi and Defense Minister Nobu Kishi, Abe's younger brother. There are also three women and as many as 30 ministers who have no previous cabinet experience. The new team has an average age of 61.8 years, higher than the 60.4 years at the time of Suga's inauguration last year. Kishida's administration is tasked with leading Tokyo out of the coronavirus pandemic as well as reviving its stagnating economy. He vowed to bolster the country's coronavirus response and said he would consider COVID-19 relief payouts. I would like to consider cash payouts targeted to those hardest hit by the pandemic who are also in vulnerable positions such as women, non-regular workers and students. In the future, we would like to decide on how much cash payouts we will make after discussing the specific plans. On foreign policy, Kishida is expected to support a strong alliance with the U.S. and address security threats from China and North Korea. The 64-year-old said he is open to meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un without any preconditions. Attention is also drawn to how Kishida's government will approach and resolve Seoul and Tokyo's sour relations. The two sides have long been at odds over territory and other historical issues, including the South Korean victims of forced labor during Japan's colonial rule. The new prime minister plans to dissolve parliament next Thursday and hold a parliamentary election by the end of this month. Min Suk Kyun, Arirang News. It's the time of the year when the Nobel Prize is given to scientists to honor their groundbreaking research. The first award, the Nobel Prize in Medicine, has been given to the scientists who discover the receptors in the skin that allow us to sense heat and pressure. These could lead to new findings that can treat chronic pain, or Chang Taehyun reports. The 2021 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded jointly on Monday local time to two American scientists, David Julius and Arden Pateputian. They were awarded the prize for their work on how people sense heat, cold, touch, and their own bodily movements. Physiologist Dr. Julius used an ingredient of hot chili pepper to identify a protein on nerve cells that responds to hot temperatures. The capsaicin from chili pepper activated a channel on the surface of cells known as TRIP-V1, which was also identified as the nerve sensor that allows the skin to respond to heat. Molecular biologist Dr. Pateputian poked individual cells with a tiny pipette and found which receptor responds to pressure. Pain and pressure were among the last sensations that scientists have been trying to explain on a molecular level. The findings have gathered interest from pharmaceutical companies looking to make non-opioid painkillers. By blocking the channel identified, they could address chronic pain. The Nobel Prize comes with a gold medal and prize money of 10 million Swedish crowns, or roughly 1.15 million U.S. dollars. The next scheduled Nobel Prize ceremony is in physics, which will be announced on Tuesday. Chang Taehyun, 
Arirang News. Now, rather than scrapping a Trump-era trade deal with China, the Biden administration has made it clear that it wants to maintain at least part of that agreement. The U.S. Trade Representative says Washington has to keep the pressure on Beijing to ensure it meets the pledges it agreed to under the previous deal. Kim hyo Sun with the details. The Biden administration has been making clean breaks with the policies of the former administration in many areas, but not when it comes to trade with China. While the U.S. plans to initiate fresh trade talks with Beijing, it will maintain tariffs on Chinese imports as it presses Beijing to fulfill its pledges to buy more American goods and services. President Biden's China trade policies were revealed for the first time Monday during a speech by U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. But above all else, we must defend to the hilt our economic interests. And that means taking all steps necessary to protect ourselves against the waves of damage inflicted over the years through unfair competition. We need to be prepared to deploy all tools and explore the development of new ones, including through collaboration with other economies and countries. She also stressed that Washington will address Beijing's failure to keep its promises under a phase one trade deal that was inked last year during President Trump's term in office. However, Tai explained the U.S. will not pursue phase two negotiations over China's state subsidies and other structural issues. I think that we are going to have uh, and intend have to have really honest conversations with China about all of the elements of the phase one agreement. These are commitments that China made. Uh, they are commitments that um, our uh, businesses um, and uh, workers in certain sectors have looked to. Um, and um, um, we will have to address where this relationship goes from this starting point. The Biden administration has spent months reviewing its China trade policy, including the tariffs levied by the former Trump administration on some 370 billion U.S. dollars worth of Chinese imports. The imports in question range from electronics and furniture to items that are part of the supply chain for many U.S. manufacturers. Kim hyo Arirang News. Heavily indebted Chinese real estate giant Evergrande is said to raise over 5 billion U.S. dollars by selling a majority stake in its property management unit. According to local media Monday, Chinese real estate firm Hobson Development was the buyer of the 51 percent stake in the unit. Trading of Evergrande shares was suspended on Monday pending an announcement related to major transaction. Evergrande has a debt of more than $300 billion, and the fate of the company has implications not just in China, but on the global market. Ministers from the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and their allies, known as OPEC+, Plus, have decided to continue with their existing oil output plan to only gradually add oil to the market. The 23-member group agreed on Monday to raise production by a modest 400,000 barrels a day in November, less than 0.5 percent on global demand. Immediately after Monday's decision, oil prices jumped, with the price of a barrel of crude hitting above 78 U.S. dollars on the New York Mercantile Exchange, the highest since 2014. A pipeline failure off the coast of Orange County, California, has caused at least 126,000 gallons of oil to spill into the Pacific Ocean by Sunday, a day after the failure. Dead fish and birds started washing ashore. It created a 20-kilometer-long slick that extended from Huntington Beach all the way to Newport Beach. It's not immediately clear what caused the leak. Officials believe it involved a failure in a 28-kilometer-long pipeline connected to an offshore oil platform operated by Better Offshore. A probe is underway to pinpoint the cause of the spill and the type of oil involved. In sports, South Korea's Shin Yu Bin has finished runner-up in the women's individual event at the 2021 Asian Table Tennis Championships in Doha. Facing Japan's Hina Hayata on Sunday, the 17-year-old sensation won the first set before dropping the next three to earn the silver medal. The silver medal is Shin's first 
medal at an international event. It also marks South Korea's first silver at the Asian Championships in 53 years. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Taiwan's defense ministry said Monday that 52 Chinese warplanes made incursions into its air defense identification zone, marking the highest number since the island began publicly reporting such activities last year. The latest incursions come after 39 Chinese military planes flew into the zone on Saturday. Among the 52 Chinese aircrafts that flew through the zone, 34 J-16 fighter jets, 12 H-6 bombers, two Su-30 fighters, two Y-8 anti-submarine warfare planes, and two KJ-500s were sighted by the Defense Ministry. The map released by the ministry showed that all 52 incursions were spotted at the extreme southwestern part of Taiwan's ADIZ. In response to the Chinese activity, radio warnings were issued, with air defense missile systems also being deployed to monitor the incursions. China's state-run Global Times on Sunday said the People's Liberation Army was conducting expanded drills near the island. However, the incursions do not violate Taiwan's sovereign airspace, which extends 12 nautical miles from its coast. Since last October, 145 incursions by Chinese warplanes have been reported by Taiwan. If you're asking how some of the world's richest and most powerful people hide their money, the answer may be found in almost 12 million financial documents known as the Pandora Papers. According to a report by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, some of the current world leaders hid massive sums of money in overseas accounts. This includes the King of Jordan, who secretly spent more than 100 million U.S. dollars on a property empire in the U.K. and the U.S. However, the papers also names current world leaders, such as Czech President Andrei Babis, Kenyan President Uru Kenyatta, Ecuador's leader Guillermo Lasso, as well as Russian President Vladimir Putin. However, they're just among a handful of more than 330 current and former politicians identified as beneficiaries of secret accounts. According to a report, many accounts were designed to evade taxes and conceal assets. The Pandora Papers are a follow-up to a similar report released in 2016 known as the Panama Papers, which was compiled by the same journalistic group. Finally, over in Oman, at least 13 people are dead after Tropical Storm Shaheen ravaged the country on Monday. Cars and roads were submerged in heavy floodwaters, with the storm carrying winds of between 120 and 150 kilometers per hour at its peak. Oman State TV showed people in flooded areas being rescued by helicopters, while tractors plowed through mud. The storm was initially labeled a cyclone before losing power over land to downgrade to a tropical storm. Lee seung Arirang News. Now it's time for Global Insight, where we connect with experts from around the world to hear their views on issues making headlines. Japan's Fumio Kishida took office as Prime Minister on Monday, vowing to make efforts to lead the country out of the COVID-19 pandemic and tackle income inequality. After win winning a leadership race within the ruling Liberal Democratic Party last week, a parliamentary vote confirmed him as the head of government. He named his key cabinet members and also called a, for a uh, parliamentary election for October 31st, a much earlier date than many expected, although his party is, of course, more than likely to retain its majority in the decision-making body. 
Today we discuss what's ahead for Japan's 100th Prime Minister as he sets out to lead the world's third largest economy and also how he's going to shape the country's foreign policy amid various global and regional challenges. And for this we welcome back Craig Mark, a Professor of International Studies at Kuritsu Women's University and Alexis Dudden, Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. It's lovely to see you both. And well, we've got a lot of ground to cover here, so let's start with you, Professor Mark. Um, now, it's been a very interesting week, uh, the past week we've had, and a very exciting weekend. Uh, well, now, uh, Mr. Kishida, he took office as Prime Minister on Monday, and he, um, well, his first agenda is going to be, of course, tackling COVID-19 and boosting the uh, economy. But, um, well, what's he going to do? What is, what's, he going to, what's going to be his first steps as Prime Minister? Well, uh, thanks for having me back. Um, this uh, Friday, he's going to give a uh, policy speech to Parliament uh, just before it dissolves next week. And uh, in that speech, we're probably going to get more details about how he proposes to stimulate the economy uh, to recover from the pandemic. In his uh, first press conference as Prime Minister last night, he did mention a couple of details like uh, increasing wages for public sector workers, like uh, teachers and nurses. Uh, so he is going to push his uh, direction of a new Japanese capitalism, a bit of a departure from uh, Abenomics. So uh, having a stimulus package and continuing to tackle the uh, pandemic as vaccinations continue to roll out that's going to be his first priority and his main pitch for uh, winning the election which is going to be at halloween and now professor dodden let's talk about um his win of the leadership race uh, last week it seemed like there was a 50 50 going on here with taro kono um what do you think really helped mr kushida solidify his win um against the more popular and admittedly more interesting uh, mr taro kono well, I think uh, with all due respect, um, Abe figured out how to come back into power. And uh, so there were two people set up to divide the race. And if you look at that initial vote, uh, Kishida won by one vote. And so the, the other Abe back candidates uh, kind of divided and took away the votes from Kono Tado. Uh, who is most interesting is difficult to tell. Obviously, Kono is uh, more engaging. He's unusual. He speaks better English. At the same time, Kishida has a sort of similar study abroad track record. He was in second and third grade in New York City. Uh, so who knows what he'll do. Uh, what we do know is he's brought Abe Shinzo back into the fold. And Professor Mark, um, Mr. Kishida, he started naming his cabinet members on Monday and uh, it looks like former education minister Hirokasu Masano, he's going to be uh, Kishida's chief cabinet secretary and um, the new prime minister, he looks like he's going to hang on to the um, in, uh, many of the key incumbent members of the cabinet, such as the justice and um, sorry, the defence and uh, foreign ministers. What do these candidates tell us about the kind of government that Kashida is going to be leading? Well, the most striking thing is keeping the defence and foreign minister the same. So that does show the uh, influence of, you could say, the most powerful faction in the LDP, the Hosoda faction, which uh, Mr Abe is a member of. Uh, however, uh, he does have most of the cabinet being brand new members, uh, 13 out of the 20. And so uh, Mr. Kishida is uh, trying to blunt the criticism of opposition politicians saying, oh, it's just an Abe cabinet and he's the shadow shogun pulling the strings. Uh, so uh, he'll be using his uh, authority of an election win to also uh, try and make the point that it's his government, not Abe's government. And well, as you both have mentioned, uh, many have sensed former uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe looming behind the scenes. And well, Professor Dudden, how much autonomy and authority do you think Kashida is going to have? Um, do you think he's going to be constrained by his faction where uh, Shinzo Abe does very much remain a very influential figure? 
It's, it's an excellent question, and I completely agree with Professor Mark. I think there are two ways to answer this question. One is to be broadly comparative and to look at what just happened in Germany, right? Where every, you know, we had an election, Angela Merkel, and everything's up for grabs, and there are all kinds of new people involved. In Japan, we've had a turnover, and uh, on the one hand, yes, as Professor Mark has just mentioned, Kishida is putting new names in. Uh, at the same time, uh, more than the faction is the lobby group behind this, the Nippon Kaigi, the Japan Conference. And here I would have people pay attention to Chief Cabinet, the new Chief Cabinet Secretary, Matsuno. Uh, he is not a new figure. He is somebody very hard line. And uh, I think a lot will depend on how he articulates policies for this administration. So personally, I'm not expecting a huge departure uh, from the past. I agree that there's going to be a focus on domestic income doubling plans, to quote something from 1950s. Uh, but I think we're really looking at uh, a new way of defining Japan first uh, in the region. And indeed, uh, Professor Mark, during his bid for LDP leadership last week, um, Kishida spoke about uh, increasing middle class incomes and also reducing wealth disparity. But all this time, he's been seen as more of a stable figure than a reformer. Do you think that's going to be enough, though? Um, is it going to be enough to play it safe when tackling the country's structural problems? Yeah, well, we'll have to see if uh, the uh, rhetoric of a new Japanese capitalism and redistributing income actually comes to pass, uh, particularly how can he encourage the larger corporation to lift wages and uh, how can he convince them to push more people onto permanent contracts rather than the higher number of people on uh, unstable employment. So that's going to be a big challenge. And also, can he stimulate uh, the regions, uh, particularly rural areas with declining populations? Uh, it's interesting, uh, someone who's returned to the cabinet is uh, Seiko Noda, his, uh, one of his female opponents in the leadership race. She's been given the job of a revitalization minister and uh, addressing gender inequality and population decline. Um, so he's got big challenges to fix the structural uh, challenges of the Japanese economy, and particularly as the pandemic ends and as borders open up, uh, the, we need to see the extent to uh, whether foreign workers return to help boost the labor force and uh, will foreign tourists return in large numbers, international students. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see how the actual uh, policies roll out uh, after the election, assuming he uh, wins government. So many domestic challenges that um, Mr. Kishida faces, but also there are questions around his foreign policy as well. Um, the, uh, Professor Dudden, the incumbent defence and foreign ministers, uh, they're set to retain their positions in the Kushida administration. What do you think this is going to mean for the country's foreign policy, primarily in regards to its role in Quad and also its position on China? Well, interestingly, uh, Defence Minister Kishi in recent weeks has been going out of his way to make a lot of statements about Japan's position on Taiwan. And I think that's going to be the first test. I mean, as, as your uh, news report has made clear, uh, Beijing, to celebrate its national day over the weekend, had a lot of air incursions in Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Uh, and so really how the Kishida administration responds for Japan, but also a Japan that is repositioning itself in the quad and also this new construct of AUKUS with uh, an Australia, uh, British, American uh, maritime force. So I think Japan is, is it, it, for a historian to say a country is at a crossroads, it's kind of a cop out. I think uh, the test that Abe had wanted for his own administration involving the constitutional amendments he saw may come to the into the fore for Kishida. And here uh, we really will be looking at Taiwan, maybe most of all. 
I'm Professor Dodden, of course the ruling LDP, they're no career files by any means, but um, Kashida, he was considered a more dovish candidate than his contenders during the race um, when it comes to East Asia relations. In fact, Beijing media has openly shown preference for uh, Fumio Kishida. Do you think he would show more interest in regional cooperation than his predecessors, Yoshihide Suga and Shinzo Abe? So this, it's a really tricky question, to be honest, because if you look at the parliamentarian leagues, the, the, the friendship groups between uh, South Korea and Japan, the LDP actually does have quite deep ties with many South Korean politicians. At the same time, when the so-called history disputes come to the fore, when history is weaponized and turned into a security threat, then kind of all bets are off. And here, here's the problem, because both Kishida, but more to the point, other members of the cabinet are very clear. They deny the existence of historical atrocities committed uh, during Japan's occupation of Korea, wartime colonial histories. And so uh, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, Kishida has said, you know, everything is settled with South Korea, forced labor, slave labor, the history of sexual enslavement. And this very much uh, also pertains, again, back to Chief Cabinet Secret Secretary Matsuno, who has even denied the existence of the history of the enslavement of Korean women under the Japanese occupation. So we're really going to have to see what unfolds. Uh, you know, and, and this also pertains to, the, to histories uh, not limited to Korea, but also the Nanjing massacre. Uh, some members of the new cabinet in print have denied the history of the Nanjing massacre. So we'll really have to see how this plays out regionally. And Professor Mark, uh, what are your views on this? I mean, with the current foreign minister likely to stay on uh, where he is, what does that mean for Kishida's foreign policy towards countries like South Korea and China? Uh, well, the, uh, uh, it was reported on the Japanese media that uh, last night that uh, uh, President uh, Moon Jae-in and Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin uh, sent congratulatory messages uh, to Mr. Kishida and are hoping that they can have uh, stable relations, uh, So, which is nice of them to do. But uh, I think the big challenges are going to be in foreign policy. Can any stable relations be restored? Uh, for South Korea, uh, really, I think the... Uh, Kishida government is going to wait until next year, until the presidential elections, uh, when they hope a more conservative administration uh, will replace Mr. Moon to uh, maybe have some more progress there. Uh, as for China, uh, they are going to continue to uh, push uh, the Quad and support Taiwan, as uh, Professor Dudden referred to, and also uh, AUKUS. Uh, Japan has welcomed the AUKUS agreement, and uh, uh, defence uh, cooperation with the UK is uh, increasing as well. So who knows, uh, AUKUS could become JORKUS uh, under the Kishida government. Uh, so but, uh, we'll, uh, the overall uh, uh, direction of foreign policy will still uh, strongly support the US alliance and still be confronting China. So the balance of maintaining relations with China as its uh, closest trading partner uh, is going to be a probably the biggest challenge uh, for the Kishida government in foreign policy. Oh, well, Professor Dudden, um, while bilateral relations between Seoul and Tokyo broke down um, in 2019 with Tokyo taking steps to hurt South Korea's semiconductor industry, Seoul did retaliate initially, but it later reached out to Tokyo um, for dialogue a number of times at various occasions where their heads of government or their foreign ministers were at the same place. Why do you think Japan has been so evasive so far? And do you think there's enough common ground right now for the two countries to come together? To, there is enough com common ground. There is always sufficient common ground. Uh, why is this so uh, difficult? Is because the idea of Korea, that is to say the word Korea in Japan, is politically very important and it carries a lot of weight for political purposes. And so 
being evasive, not having a real policy. It's in the in American politics, it's like throwing the term immigration around. And I don't mean to sound strange, but it's it's a word rather than a place or a people for Japanese politicians to shore up their own support base. And so it's very difficult to make policy when you're using it for political purposes. At the same time, of course, there are deep ties, economic ties, social ties, family ties, historical ties. And especially now, the time is right for Korea and Japan to be able to work together. As Professor Mark mentioned, uh, President Moon Jae-in has reached out saying he's eager to work with the Kishida administration. So it's actually the ball is in Tokyo's court. But then, um, well, you said the ball is in Tokyo's court, but um, Professor Dudden, Kushida has recently uh, spoken about the 2015 bilateral comfort women deal that he helped um, draw up. And he said that the ball is in South Korea's court. Uh, what do you think is going to be his approach to historical issues? And what steps do you think uh, should be taken between the two sides in order to improve their bilateral relations? Well, unfortunately, Kishida and many members of his cabinet um, have a, a view of history that uh, doesn't necessarily involve evidence. So if we're gonna use history for political gain, then I'm not really optimistic. If, however, Kishida is interested in creating a regional detente, then uh, for him to lead uh, what many Japanese believe would be beneficial to the region and listen to uh, survivors of this history to go with a more humanitarian understanding of the 20th century because honestly and i guess this is all i'll say this is not an issue between japan and korea this is an issue of world history and it is in japan's benefit to lead the region on this issue and it could be up to kishida to win and now, before we go, uh, Professor Mark, uh, Mr. Kishida's party, they're going to be launching their parliamentary election campaign in the coming weeks, as the new prime minister did call a uh, very um, much more um, earlier than anticipated election. So what is this process going to look like and why do you think he called it so early? I mean, is the timing going to uh, favour his party? Uh, yes, it does benefit uh, the LDP. Uh, he said that, well, he wants to get the mandate of the people and get to work as fast as possible, uh, but really it puts the opposition parties at a disadvantage. Uh, the campaign is going to officially start on October the 19th after the uh, diet is dissolved next week on Thursday. And uh, so it's going to be a short campaign of less than two weeks, which gives the opposition uh, less time to organise and mobilise and campaign. And... Uh, so the uh, LDP is very likely to uh, keep its majority. It might lose a number of seats, uh, but it's pretty much guaranteed that uh, uh, Mr. Kishida and his coalition with the uh, Komato party uh, will be comfortably returned. Uh, it'll be interesting to see though next year, the uh, upper house elections are due uh, in the middle of next year for half the house of councillors. And uh, if uh, things don't work out so well and he loses his majority in the upper house, it's uh, much more narrow, uh, then that could uh, give him bigger problems uh, in the year to come. Well, that's all we have time for today. That was Craig Mark, Professor of International Studies at Corizzo Women's University and Alexis Studden, Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. On and off rain is in the forecast from this afternoon for areas north of the central areas. We'll have see heavy showers in the northern Kangdo province during the day before they spread to the rest of the central region tonight. But southern provinces will have a warm day under sunny skies. Many temperatures in the capital are quite warm, over 23 degrees Celsius, and we have sunshine to start the day. Highs in northern regions won't rise much from the morning lows, so Seoul will only go up to 25 degrees. But southern provinces will enjoy sunshine all day with warm highs. Daegu and Gwangju hitting 29 degrees. 
It's going to be cooler than this season norms through the end of the week with frequent rain across Korea, so please keep an umbrella handy. With that, here's a look at the weather conditions around the globe. And that's where we're going to leave it for now. Thank you for joining us. I'm Kim Mogan. And I'm Mark Broom. Thank you to all our guests and reporters today. New day at Arirang will be back at 8 a.m. Korea time tomorrow. And I myself will be back with more news in around an hour from now. So keep tuned to Arirang TV. Goodbye. Goodbye.